before we start, we just wanted to thank you for joining our presentation. We know it has been a difficult climate in the world right now, and that we really just appreciate your time coming to learn about the situation as well. It's definitely not easy, but talking about it's definitely the first step. So before we start, I just want to go over a little bit of logistics. Like I said, this presentation is hosted by UW Recycling. Um, a little bit about our mission statement. We provide innovative recycling, composting, and waste reduction solutions. I would say we have unmatched passion for the health of our campus and planet. I'm really proud to be a part of this team. Um, in celebration of Plastic Free July, we wanted to host this free screening. We are really excited to talk about it with you today, even though it is a little difficult. Uh, just a couple more logistical points. We want to have you all remain on mute for the duration of the presentation, unless otherwise stated. Uh, please send the chat function. Please use the chat function to send any questions or comments or ideas throughout the presentation. Feel free to send them to everyone. We would all love to kind of share the same thoughts and ideas. Uh, I do want to mention this discussion is being recorded. We want to make this recording available on Facebook and later. YouTube after the event, so we will send those out later. And then one last acknowledgement before we start the presentation, I just wanted to give a brief land acknowledgement. So the University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land. That is the land that touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Snoqualmish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. So let's go to the next slide and get this started. Okay, so before we get into the nitty gritty, I did just want to go over some key takeaways of the film since there was a lot to consider. This is just a couple key, key takeaways, but there are definitely more to think about. Uh, the first biggest one is that plastic is a byproduct of the fossil fuel industry. Um, it would not be as prevalent in our communities and products without the push from these industries, which is important to remember. I also wanted to touch on that recycling is a complex global system. Uh, when you try to recycle in Washington, it does rarely stay in the state or even the country. Uh, we will touch on the difficulties and nuances of this later in the presentation. Um, there's also a point that recycling is not the primary solution to managing our waste. Uh, this does clash with what our societal norm currently is. Uh, recycling should be a component of good waste management, but not the larger solution. Um, we also wanted to touch on that recycling is currently seen by many as a way to reduce consumerism guilt. This does increase the amount of items we all feel comfortable disposing of, which is a negative impact. And then we also wanted to touch on that minorities and people of color are more likely to be impacted by plastic pollution. Uh, the documentary did touch on this, but the negative effects are complex and should carefully be considered and addressed for the foreseeable future. And then the documentary also mentioned litter cleanups. Uh, we also wanted to echo the sentiment that this will not solve plastic pollution. This is a small band-aid on a very large wound. It can actually harm marine life when done on an industrial level using nets and equipment. It also pretty much always fails to capture microplastics, which is a big issue. So the crux of all this is that it's important to consider the overall life cycle of our purchases. This is definitely the first step to getting better as consumers. You need to remember that products still exist when you throw it away, even if it is in the recycling. So I will have Audrey take the next slide. Thank you, Madeline. Um, all right, so let's start off by talking about recycling at UW. So does recycling at UW work? Um, we want to emphasize that recycling works with quality infrastructure and quality material. There also are some key things to remember in order to help us recycle well. We want to avoid wish cycling, which is when you put something in the bin hoping that it will be recycled, but not really knowing if it will be or not. And this is because if a material is not able to be processed by our local recycling infrastructure, the best case scenario is that it will end up in a landfill after resources are spent removing it from the recycling stream. And the worst case is that it's not removed during the sorting process, so then it will contaminate a bale of recyclables, and then there's a chance that this bale of recyclables may entirely be sent to the landfill. A handy little phrase to remember is, when in doubt, throw it out. Uh, though the landfill system is far from perfect and landfills use up a lot of space, well-managed landfills ensure material will not become a pollutant or a health hazard. It's better to throw something away than to risk contaminating the recycling or also the compost uh, waste streams. 
It's also helpful to keep in mind the four S's for material to be recyclable in your curbside or office bin. It needs to be sortable at the recycling facility and have adequate and consistent supply to be made into new items. Be safe for transporting and processing. Uh, and have quality and value that makes the material sellable to manufacturers. At the University of Washington, we do our best to make recycling work following all of these key points and through making recycling as easy as possible for the students, staff, and faculty on campus. Um, just a few highlights. Uh, we implemented the Minimax program in all academic and facilities building, which is that little green desk side bin and attached trash bin that you may have at your own desk. Minimax bins replaced uh, lined trash bins and effectively save 16,000 plastic waste liners every day. Uh, Minimax also increased access to single stream recycling as well as compost receptacles across campus, making waste sorting simple. Uh, also, to, also worth mentioning is that UW Recycling in 2018 commissioned a waste characterization study so that we could get an idea of what our waste is composed of and determine areas for improvement. Um, we generate 12,000 tons of waste annually, and this is all waste streams combined. Um, and 10% of that material is plastic. And we'll talk a little bit more about the waste characterization study later on. So, uh, next, please. Okay, so I just want to touch a little bit more about the little blurb we have up there, which is that recycling works with quality infrastructure and quality material. A quality material is something the documentary explored a lot, which is huge. Um, there's a lot of material that we try to recycle that really isn't helpful with recycling, so I will go over that a little bit with this chart. Um, a big one is plastic film, chip bags, rubber gloves, and blister packaging. These are all items that people feel like they should be able to recycle or maybe just want to recycle. It plays into that idea of wish cycling. Um, the problem is they are all light and flat enough to be sorted out with the paper in recycling centers. This makes it really difficult for the paper to be a high enough quality to actually be recycled into a new material. So it just plays into that component that which cycling can actually hurt that ability for anything to be recycled. Um, another big ticket like group of items is small plastic, so bottle caps, utensils, zip ties. All of these are little plastic items and people think, oh, like this is plastic, I could probably recycle this but these are small and heavy enough to get sorted out with the glass, which also affects that recycling. Um, there's also a couple other items that we commonly see that are on the screen here. Um, these all tangle in the gears or heavy or oddly shaped items can damage equipment. They can also endanger workers trying to get the equipment to work again. Um, so all of these are important to think about. I also wanted to mention that at UW specifically, our biggest contaminant in the recycling is plastics that still have food or liquids in them. Um, a big example of this is soda bottles. Uh, the, all of that material can actually mold over the recycling. Um, it can make it unable to be resold or made into new material. So it's important to avoid items that you aren't sure could be recycled or not, um, just because it actually can affect recycling that really could work and not do the issues that happened in the documentary. Um, before we move on, I do want to mention that UW does take some special care with specific items, um, but they have to go through special recycling programs. Our biggest one is plastic film. You can recycle a lot of types of plastic film at UW specifically if you collect it separately than the regular recycling bin. So you collect it on its own and um, call us instead of just putting it in the blue bin. Uh, you can email us or visit our disposal guide if you're unsure how to recycle an item like that, but there are some solutions if you're at UW. Uh, feel free to go to the next slide. All right, so uh, now we're going to talk about uh, where recycling from UW and the greater Seattle area ends up. As we saw in the film, um, waste can really travel um, quite a long distance before it reaches its final resting place. And so we're just gonna share what we know um, about where UW's waste goes. Um, this is the best information that we have. Um, so just to give you an overview of you know, the general recycling process, so you put it in your bin, it's picked up by a truck, it's taken to a transfer station or a material recovery facility known as a MRF. Then it's sorted into different material types, baled, and those bales are bought by manufacturers and they use the recycled materials to make new items. 
Um, so after everything is bailed, um, we know that glass stays in Seattle and is used by a local bottle manufacturer. Metal stays, metal, steel, and iron also stay in Seattle for recycling. Tin goes to Tennessee, aluminum stays in North America, and most paper and cardboard is recycled at mills in southern Washington and Oregon, and the rest is sent overseas uh, to be recycled in Asia. And then mixed plastics go up north to British Columbia. Um, at UW, our waste is recycled by Waste Management, a private company, and they compete with other companies to find markets. Um, this hinders our ability to track where exactly our waste goes after reaching these primary destinations because companies don't always like to publicly share details about who is buying their recyclables. Next slide. Okay, and then I really wanted to touch on the waste hierarchy because I think it can put recycling into a different context than what we've been speaking of. So a big issue that also the documentary heavily implies, which I think is true, is that we think of recycling as something at the top of the waste hierarchy, something that's the end all be all to managing our waste and can fix everything. But if you actually look at this hierarchy, it's much lower than other better solutions. Um, basically, if we prioritize other waste practices, such as reducing, reusing, and avoiding what we don't need, the plastic would already have a much lesser impact on our communities and we could focus on recycling items that actually can be turned into new and good material. So when placed in the right location on this hierarchy, it becomes a lot less of a problem and more of a component to a better solution. As I said, a lot of times our society places this at the top of the hierarchy. Um, I do want to mention just some quick little ideas. Um, there's obviously more than what I'm about to say about um, changing your habits just to get recycling a little bit lower on that personal hierarchy for you. So you could buy new durable plastic products or you could just try to borrow, rent, or buy used first. Um, Seattle Tool Libraries is a great way to just borrow items um, that's cheaper for you and also does place um, reusing and reducing higher up on the hierarchy. A big one for avoiding is giving up bottled water. Bottled water is a huge, um, way that we use plastic in our society and giving that up makes a big difference. Uh, carrying reusable shopping bags is another great way to do this. Um, avoiding single serving sizes or buying in bulk is also another great way just to reduce the amount of plastic you're using. Um, I also wanted to mention that when you order products online, you can send a message ahead of time to the seller requesting zero plastic packaging and that does work more than you would expect. So even taking that initiative can really help and also change the culture. Um, looking for solid or powdered versions of cleaning and personal care products can also reduce packaging, as well as shopping locally at farmer's markets, which we will touch on later in the presentation. So feel free to go to the next. Okay, thanks, Madeline. Um... So here's just a rather broad list of a couple things that we want to acknowledge. Um, first of all, it's a huge privilege to be able to focus on reducing waste, to spend time planning, to have access to farmer's markets, to buy glass containers for your food, to spend time thrifting instead of ordering online. Sometimes it takes more time to find what you need. Um, and also zero waste lifestyles can save money in the long run, that we know, but the initial and upfront investment can be um, a daunting cost sometimes. Uh, also, the responsibility for waste reduction and reuse often falls on the shoulders of women and mothers. Additionally, low waste lifestyles are not new. As we learned in the film, low waste is normal until corporations undercut economies with disposable options. Uh, low waste is already embedded in many minority cultures in the US, but the low waste movement often does not highlight their voices. And as the film showed, producers make it very hard to live in a world without buying new disposable things. And due to the scale of the systems involved, consumers can only do so much by buying right and recycling right. Um, but if you can't afford to adjust your lifestyle to reduce plastic, maybe you can support an organization that will do the work for you. We'll probably say this at least a few more times, but you can really magnify your difference by finding and supporting legislation and initiatives that you care about. Um, yeah, so with that, uh, I'd like to take a moment to ask our audience to participate and open the chat. 
And if you could just write what your biggest barrier to using less plastic is. And we'll give you a couple seconds to do that. I know for me, my biggest barrier is, yeah, just like um, from day, Doug, that it's just convenient. I have to spend time ahead of time to think about what I want to buy in order to reduce plastic. Time and convenience, reliance on food packaged using plastics, excessive packaging, hard to refuse and find alternatives exactly. Biggest barrier is that it's difficult to find things packaged in other ways. Mm -hmm. Buy-in from family members, yep, that can be hard if you have to get your whole, whole household on board. Difficult to buy items, food or otherwise, you need that is not packaged in plastic. I rely on frozen food, it's all wrapped in plastic, same here. <laughs> Understanding where the biggest gains might be, where to start to get the best outcomes for the environment. Mm -hmm. My child, right now she eats so many food packets. If I was not working, it would be easier to make my own baby food, but I work and just need her to eat. Yes, yeah, so we were just talking about that at work, about how all of the like baby food and applesauce is in those little sachets now instead of glass containers. I didn't know I had to dry my recyclables. That seems also almost impossible. Laundry soap, plastic is unavoidable. Mm-hmm. Not being sure what's the best option, getting overwhelmed by info. It can be difficult to find plastic free replacements on items we already rely on. Mm -hmm. Money is a barrier, purchasing from PCC versus Trader Joe's, mm -hmm. and finding bulk stores. Yeah, especially with bulk stores, we'll get into some resources later into the presentation. So hopefully with mm -hmm. that one, we can at least help. Yeah, thank you all for participating, and um, I really like those responses. Um, good things to think about, and for, for now, we are going to move on to the next slide. Yeah, and as Audrey was saying, all of you have really good points. A lot of them I can relate to myself. I'm sure all of us can. Um, <clears throat> it kind of touches on, in the again, in the documentary that we need a lot of systematic changes to make this happen, but the first step really is awareness. Um, most people aren't aware of how much packaging or plastic they're truly using. So even just getting this information out there and reading your responses is extremely helpful just to figure out where we could even start. Um, so I just wanted to go into what else we can do um, as people. So as I was saying, you can continue to educate yourself about the ways plastic impacts our world. Again, there are some positives, there are a lot of negatives and especially in how they impact uh, environmental justice. This is something not as explored as it should be. Um, sharing what you've learned with your community, we just tried to do that with the chat a little bit, but we should continue to do so with your own um, like subgroups. So we do wanna mention that you could vote for changes you'd like to see, but as Washington State employees, we do strictly adhere to the Ethics and Public Service Act. We cannot promote ballot initiatives or lobby the state legislature. So what we really wanna say with this is that it's important to even know what's being passed or what's out there so you can make an informed decision on if it should pass or not. Um, making small changes in your life, so viewing your consumables in the lens of the waste hierarchy is huge. I think even though we might all say we know that reducing, reusing, and refusing is higher up, we probably still are placing recycling higher in our personal lives. So. Just maybe taking one object at a time or one action at a time and really making that change, even just one can make a big difference. Uh, one of these ways is you can take advantage of community resources. There's so many buy nothing groups, especially on Facebook, that can help you not um, buy something new. There's also Free Cycle, which is a great resource and website that we will send out later um, that can help you, again, like make sure you can get something for even cheaper and not use something new. 
So again, you can also research sustainability initiatives currently happening. A lot of times this is city-based and not laws, um, but you can still support them or not support them and figure out what the right course of action is. Uh, in terms of future uh, education, we do have a recent blog post called Trashy Entertainment. It's posted, um, we will post a link in the chat, but basically it's a really great way to just have more resources to look and like educate yourself more on the issue. Uh, there's also an upcoming screening and discussion by Sustainable Ballard. It's called Bag It, Is Your Life Too Plastic? We will send a link for this as well. It sounds really cool and we're excited to check it out. Um, you can also view our recorded discussion about Zero Waste Washington's projects and legislation on our Facebook or on UW Sustainability's YouTube channel. They have a great channel to check out. Um, and like I said, we try to host this stuff as much as we can. It, this is definitely not just a one-off presentation on this issue. Um, there's always more to check out. There's a lot of people working on this and it's great to take a look at. So we can go on to the next slide, but these are all great things to consider. So we're coming close to the end of um our this peer information part of the presentation and after this we'll be moving on to some questions that we collected from you all but first of all we want to talk about how you can reach out to us um, if you have questions later on um, that come to your mind or you have ideas that you want to share with us uh, you can go ahead and reach us at recycle at uw.edu and also you can visit our website check out the uw disposal guide um, and even though everything is virtual right now, we would love to talk about this or talk about um, how you can reduce your waste um, at your job or at your, in your own life. Um, so we do all sorts of recycling and waste reduction workshops. And Liz just sent out the links to our resources in the chat. So now we're going to switch over to talking about some questions that we researched for you all. Okay, so we have, is it better to buy a recyclable plastic item or a low plastic item? So talking about the comparison between like a recyclable hard plastic bottle versus a, um, a disposable sachet that would need to uh, go to the landfill. And so sachets were mentioned in the film as a major cause of waste in Southeast Asia. And to me, it makes more sense to purchase something in a bottle because the thin PET sachets cannot be recycled. All thicker bottles can be if they're clean, empty, and dry. And sachets were shown to be a, yeah, just a huge source of pollution because they're lightweight and can easily end up in bodies of water. Um, but there's some more um, layers to this issue. Um, like if you have the option between a larger sachet, like the image on the right, and a thicker recyclable container, the best option might be different. And so I'm actually going to pass it over to Liz, who has some more thoughts on this. Hi, everyone. I, I manage the UW Recycling Office. And this is a question that we, uh, as recycling professionals, struggle with. In the office, we actually have some disagreements. So um, it's pretty normal for us to try to figure out what the best option is. Um, the real answer is it, it's all not great. Um, with uh, refill containers, often I actually opt for that, that um, sachet or pouch version for a refill um, because it takes less plastic to be produced and um, it takes less fuel to transport that material. Um, but, but if that um, refill bottle, that Myers bottle or whatever the case may be, that soft soap bottle, if it's um, made out of recycled plastic and then it, um, and if it's more likely to be recycled, it could be the better option. Um, but it's, it's really hard to know um, what the full carbon footprint of each purchase is. And this is one we struggle with a lot because they're not great options. And I believe Madeline mentioned before, there are some powdered options, there's some tablet options. Um, when bulk uh, reopens in a lot of places, those are really affordable to, to get bulk uh, laundry detergent or hand soap. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really hard to determine which is the best option between two different plastic options. There's so many ways to calculate that. So 
So we appreciate that everyone is pretty confused about that because we are too. <laughs> Thanks, Audrey. Thank you. And I think with that, we can go on to the next one. Yes, yeah, so I want to address a question that I think is super important for figuring out what to do in the future, especially the stuff that you should recycle, which is what do the chasing arrows on plastics mean? So what's interesting about this is that all this is referring to is what type of plastic was used to make the item. It does not determine recyclability whatsoever. There is a lot of debate and even documentaries discussing that the chasing arrows is confusing for consumers and may even help people relax with thinking that making this much plastic is okay. Um, I want to give a good example. So on uh, the screen is a little chart about what these might mean, but I want to talk about number seven as being a good example of why this doesn't mean it's recyclable. Number seven plastic is other plastic. It's just plastic that can't fit into normal categories. One of the many plastics on this list is compostable plastic. So corn plastic, and that can never ever be recycled. Um, it's made from an organic material and it will just melt. And that's really gross and stringy. Um, but again, it will also just be included as a type of plastic in a chasing arrow. So this is just not a good solution to figure out what you should recycle or if something should be recycled. Um, in Washington specifically, what we tell people to do when considering if something is actually good enough to be recycled is to look at the shape of the object and never the number. Um, the most common shapes are bottles, tubs, jugs, and cups. All of these are very easily sorted by machinery um, in recycling centers, uh, making it more likely than not to be recycled, especially if they're clean, empty, dry, uh, the classic issues that need to be addressed. Um, they should also be larger than three inches in diameter. If they are not, that can be quite difficult for machinery to pick up and could contaminate other recycling, as we mentioned before. So that's their little adjustment to that question. Um, there's a lot of behind it if you ever wanted to look more into it. Uh, I can go to the next question. Uh, someone asked if there are any laws in Washington about plastic. Uh, there is a legislature passed in 2019 that says by 2025, all packaging sold in the state must be recyclable, reusable, or compostable, and must contain 20% of post-consumer recycled content. Um, I don't know if you all remember, but having something be 100% recyclable is different. Um, depending on who you ask, there is even that place in the document, or that part in the documentary where they're talking about that toothpaste tube that could be recycled in a lab, but can't actually be recycled in a recycling center, which is the only place where it would be recycled. Um, so in the next slide, we will talk more about just what studies Washington is putting on to see what exactly 100% recyclable means as it is up for debate. Um, I also wanted to talk about how this year Washington recycled the, or sorry, Washington passed the reusable bag bill uh, this bans thin plastic carryout bags at all retail establishments. This will be in effect next January. Um, so that will be pretty interesting. Uh, and then in the next slide, we will talk a little bit more about this focus sheet that the Department of Ecology created. So I'll have Audrey take a look at that. Thank you. Yeah, so um, really closely related to the previous question, are there studies about the impacts of plastic packaging locally? And so the result of that legislation that Madeline was just talking about that was passed in, I think like September of last year. Um, so that legislation is going to limit the amount of plastic packaging and um, yeah, outline that it needs to be recyclable and compostable. And so to achieve that, the Department of Ecology commissioned a study called the Washington State Plastic Packaging Study um, and they're using uh, Cascadia Consulting. They do tons of uh, waste consulting in the area to conduct a study, um, produce reports and legislati legislative suggestions on how to meet these plastic packaging reduction goals. So this is something that in our office we're following pretty closely. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what types of suggestions and the routes that they decide to take to um, implement that uh, legislative, legislative decision. So, next slide. Okay. 
um, does composting have the same problems that recycling currently has? And so this is a really interesting question. Me personally, I love to plug composting more than recycling just because I think it's a simpler process. And, you know, after watching so many documentaries in the last couple of months, um, recycling is hard. So composting is the aerobic decomposition of organic materials by microorganisms. And that definition is from Institute of Local and Self-Reliance. Um, so compost does have some of the same issues like contamination within the compost stream, mostly from plastic, and finding people to purchase the finished compost product. Um, however, composting on an industrial and local scale diverts material from the landfill and turns it into a fully usable product that is beneficial for the environment. Uh, recycling, on the other hand, is a little bit trickier. Uh, it keeps products in the market and out of the landfill but only until they are of too poor quality to recycle again, and then they ultimately end up in the landfill. So, um, and this is except for aluminum and glass, which can in theory be recycled infinitely, but we know that um, only a fraction of those materials stay in the recycling system past one or two times um, of them ending up in the recycling bin. So another thing to consider is that recyclables need to be cleaned to be effectively recycled but that does not matter for compostable items. So we're talking about like cups and to-go ware. On campus, we um, use compostable items. Oh, it looks like- Way more often than froze. recyclable items. Huh? Oh, you froze for a sec, but I think you're back. Oh, oh yeah, my internet connection is unstable. Okay, can you hear me now though? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so as I was saying, compostable uh, materials, don't, you don't have to worry about them being clean. Um, so just the compost stream, is, it's easier to maintain a good compost stream than it is to maintain a, a good recycling stream. Um, so composting in many ways is much simpler than recycling and does not encounter the same uh, global issues. Okay, and then I did just want to say that there are a lot of questions, especially after this, of is there even a point to using plastic? Is it uh, useful in any facet of our society? And I do want to say that it is. We definitely want to talk about that if plastic is necessary, it really is necessary. So focusing on reducing or refusing the right type of plastic is important to consider. Um, the big groups of this are medical supplies, food preservation, and technological advancements. All of these can really benefit from plastic and in turn benefit our community. Uh, so all I really want to say about this is that plastic does have a place in our communities when used responsibly. So we'll just continue on to the next question, but that is a good point to make. Okay, so now we're bringing it back to that waste characterization study that we mentioned earlier. How much plastic does UW dispose of? And so basically, uh, we generate those 12,000 tons of waste annually, as we mentioned earlier, and 10% of that is plastic. Um, however, uh, 30 only 30% of the plastic that we generate is actually recyclable. And then um, we recycle only about 45% of all of that recyclable plastic. So we do have some area for improvement to um, make sure that we're recycling as much as possible. Um, it's also helpful to know that 40% of our plastic is generated from the medical center. So for um, things that like Madeline was just talking about, um, plastic is really important for medical advancement and keeping things uh, sterile. And one last fact is that we recycle 64% of PET bottles and containers from campus. Moving on. We also had a question about just the proliferation of plastics. Um, I do agree that it does feel very overwhelming. Uh, we do have a couple suggestions for how we can eliminate its use. We did talk about it a little bit, but I will just refer to the waste hierarchy once again. Uh, there are so many different graphics of this and it's really, really helpful. Uh, just purchasing low plastic items, reusable items, um, again, really evaluating if you need an item in the first place is so huge for eliminating plastic. Um, I do also want to mention that 
and this question touches on it a little bit, that we really can't eliminate all plastic, but we can steer away from unnecessary plastic. And even if we just did this, that would make a huge global impact. So there's definitely ways to help, even though it seems to be surrounding us. And again, we do just want to say that if you see legislature or guidelines that eliminate unnecessary plastic, you should care carefully consider them and see if it's the right option for your community. Uh, one great example of this is plastic bag bans. So we'll go on to the next question. Um, so we have this question. Um, is there a way to recycle Tyvek envelopes? And at first, I kind of thought that's a really simple question. Um, but it's actually a little bit more confusing than that. So um, the company DuPont was mentioned a couple times in the film and DuPont is the manufacturer of Tyvek. And Tyvek is a really useful product like if all of the different um, like medical professionals or people working in hazardous areas often have to wear those Tyvek suits, um, keeps them safe. And also Tyvek is used in um, housing a lot of times. And so we have these Tyvek envelopes and they are tear and water resistant and can be reused many times before needing to recycle them. So that's, if you do end up with something um, like that, it's great to just reuse them as much as possible. Um, and then when it does come to the actual end of the product's life, uh, the Tyvek DuPont website says that there are ways to recycle them, but you have to call a number and then presumably arrange for them to be to them for them to collect your plastic envelopes. Um, I was doing some research and I did see that in 2007 they had a take back program, but I'm sure that this program is rather limited now and it might have had some mixed success. Um, there's all sorts of these like special take back programs that companies will offer for products. And as much as we like that they do are taking some responsibility for the end of life of their product. It can be tricky to find out what they actually do with them and whether or not they are genuinely recycled or if they're just taking them back, telling you that they're going to recycle them and then, you know, they still might end up in the landfill somewhere. Hopefully not. Um, so yeah, that's just something to be aware of is that um, take back programs are just a really interesting concept. Uh, next, please. So this next question actually pairs perfectly with what Brooke just asked in the chat. Uh, the question we had received earlier was if there was any ongoing research on the impact of COVID on plastic waste globally and what the findings have been. Uh, I do want to say that Seattle did make a guidance sheet, which is on the screen, um, that is available during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, basically, the five cent charge for bags that you get in the store is temporarily suspended. Um, they do still say that you should use compliant packaging and bags whenever possible if you are a store, uh, but the return to compliant bags and packaging should also be done as soon as possible. There is no enforcement on if compliant packaging is being used right now. Um, that is just because of COVID and trying to figure out what the right thing to do is. Uh, we will send a source for this in the chat, but the current general scientific consensus um, there's always little differentiations in here, is that reusable items are safe with simple and basic hygiene practices. So as far as we know, it should be okay. We do want to mention that our vendors have told us that they are experiencing a big uptick in waste, um, especially from our current community. Uh, they do think that this is because of our current times. And then looks like Liz sent a little list of Seattle ordinances in the chat. This is great to check out. Oh, sorry, I got muted for a sec, but we can go to the next slide. Um, so we have this great question. Um, one plastic that I struggle with is produce bags. I have purchased reusable mesh bags, but they do not keep my veggies crisp. Everything wilts. I reuse bags diligently, but eventually they must be replaced. And so this is really unfortunate, and I've encountered the same issue. Um, I try not to use bags when I buy my produce um, or I use cloth produce bags and I started shopping for less produce at one time to avoid things um, getting limp or going bad in my fridge. Um, but of course that means that you have to go to the store more often which is you know inconvenient and also potentially um, you know more using more fossil fuels to get there. 
Um, however, there's this great food storage guide from Seattle Public Utilities available online. And if we didn't already, we'll share the link in the chat. And it's full of tips and tricks to help make your food last longer. And it's great, they have um, a graphic and it shows like the inside of a fridge. And they do show like one item sitting in a Ziploc plastic bag, but everything else in theory can just be arranged in a certain way. Um, and using the different humidity, levels of humidity in the drawers to try and um, prevent things from wilting. Um, so for instance, you can try and keep bananas away from other fruits because bananas give off a gas that makes other fruit ripen faster. Um, onions and potatoes need to be stored separately because onions make potatoes sprout faster. And in the fridge, you, yeah, like I mentioned, you can separate things based on um, whether it's best to store in ho lie, low or high humidity. It's totally mixed both up. Um, and if you do use loose fabric or mesh produce bags, um, you can switch to airtight containers. So of course this means that you might have to do some prep work with your veggies to get them to fit inside the containers. And beyond this uh, guide from the city, there's also a great website called savethefood.com and they have tons of other storage suggestions and a whole bunch of other resources to help uh, reduce food waste and eliminate your need for plastic bags. Next slide. Okay, so another question we got is from somebody who lives near the university, um, I'm assuming in the Seattle area, and they want to reduce their plastic consumption when grocery shopping. Uh, Again, as UW employees, we can't specifically plug areas and say this is the exact place you should go to um, purchase lower packaging places. So I want to just mention that this list we're about to provide is incomplete and solely based on the experiences we've had in our personal lives. Um, a big one is local farmers markets. There is way less packaging here. And again, it's locally sourced. So you can get items that did not take a lot of fossil fuel energy to get to you. Uh, d and Meats or any local deli, really, uh, this one is in Mount Lake Terrace, is really good at low packaging options. Uh, Whole Foods is able to wrap your meat in paper if you request it, which is great. We do suspect that there are more places that will do this if you just ask. So it's kind of like uh, when you order something online, you can request low, pack, low plastic packaging with some good success rates. Uh, Rising Sun Produce is also local and a great place to get uh, lower plastic packaging. We do want to talk about the UW Bean Basket. This is located in the hub. Um, it's suspended right now because of COVID, but should come back. Uh, it has lots of bulk items and even will give you a discount if you bring your own reusable containers, which is fantastic. Um, Liz sent a link to there in the chat and it's just awesome to check out. It's a really good program. And then we also want to talk about Litterless. Uh, Literalist is a Washington-specific website that basically has way more recommendations than we have about low plastic use or even low energy use places to get your items from, and it's just fantastic. You should definitely check that out as soon as possible. It could really make a big difference. So that's all I have to say about that. And then we have finished the Q&As that we got submitted to us, so we would love to just answer some questions in the chat. Uh, I know Liz has been collecting a couple, so we will see if she can pull those up for us and hopefully we can answer as many as we can. Um, if for some reason there's a question that we can't answer, then we will definitely research it and send it out in our um, email following this presentation. So you will get an answer. We just definitely want to make sure we're giving you good answers that have good information. All right. first question from the chat is for plastics clean and dry can be very challenging rinsing to achieve clean is isn't difficult but waiting until that bottle is dry before recycling is a real challenge and someone in the group uh, suggested um, using the dishwasher um, do y'all have uh, more info on that well I do want to say that it doesn't have to be bone dry to be recycled that does make a big difference I mean if you washed out um, like a peanut butter jar, it might take a while to get all those droplets out. It really just should be some, this is what waste management says specifically here too, so it does work here, is that nothing should be splashing out of your container. This includes like different foods. So even if um, you have a little bit of peanut butter left in your jar, it would be better to keep it completely clean 
but as of now you can recycle it um, through waste management with that peanut butter in there as long as it's not going to come out of the container. So you can definitely just make sure it's a little dry. Like when I have a yogurt cup, I shake it dry usually. I don't have a reusable towel around me. Uh, so that is a great option, I would say. Do you have anything to add, Audrey? I think that covers it. Yeah, it doesn't have to be 100% perfectly, perfectly clean, empty or dry. Um, those are just guidelines and the closer you can get it to 100% clean, empty and dry, the better. But um, like Madeline said, if you don't have the ability to like leave your yogurt container sitting out for a while to dry out, um, just give it a shake and you're good. Mm -hmm. And I do want to say that recycling is not washed in recycling facilities. What you put in is what's going to be recycled. Um, so just keep that in mind in terms of how clean something is. Um, as of now, like I said, waste management takes it. They do say they have an end market for it that recycles it 100%, but we just aren't able to see what that end market is because of their um, status as a company. All right, uh, next question is, I always wonder how things were packaged before plastic became so prevalent. Can't we rewind and go back to those methods? I know we are more convenience focused now, so that's probably a barrier. I um, I would love to take a stab at that one. That's kind of related to the produce bag question about like so we we have the plastic produce bags and then we buy the mesh produce bags to replace the plastic produce bags. But what was what did we use before that? Like <laughs> there were no plastic bags before that. We probably used paper bags or you know you brought a market to the brought a basket to the market. Um, and so I think a lot of it is like convenience, as long as we're okay with like reducing our convenience as the person who asked the question mentioned, then we can go back to like, um, just like the less convenient types of plastic packaging for our produce and all sorts of other things. And in the film, I think there was, um, they talked to somebody who um, was talking about how before all the different sachets existed, um, it would just be like open markets full of bulk produce and food that you could go and scoop up in your own glass containers. And in theory, you can still do that now. Like, you know, when COVID is not as um, prevalent, you can bring your own containers to stores and kind of get back to how it was before we had plastic everywhere. It's just a little bit more work on all of our parts. Mm -hmm. um. Again, my, the biggest thing that comes to my mind is farmer's markets. Um, when farmer's markets are open and you can just go with your own containers and get food, that's a perfect way. And I think a really good example of what we used to do. All right. Um, I didn't know I had to dry my recyclables and that seems nearly impossible. What about laundry soap? Do you know if they mean recycling their laundry soap or using laundry soap for recycling? I think um, when you have that laundry soap, it's really hard to get all that material out. Yeah, so I would, again, I'm going to default to what waste management in our area says we can do, which is that if it's not splashing out and enough of it's gone, then that is okay. Um, so for right now, that is what they say that you can do. Um, I really, like I said, don't have a good answer on how well recycled that is, but according to them, it does get recycled. But again, just reiterating, even if we needed perfectly clean items to be recycled, it still wouldn't have to be bone dry, just not splash out dry. So that would be my answer to that. I see a related question popped up, which is, um, sorry, I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Um, how do you buy laundry soap without plastic? And I really like that question because um, I use soap nuts, which are kind of a cool thing we were just talking about in the office this week. They're like these little nuts from a tree. They look kind of like acorns and you put them in a tiny little bag and just throw them in with your laundry and you can use them like a hundred times. Um, so I haven't had to buy a big jug of laundry detergent in a long time. And I think there's also, weren't we talking about that there's like, um, dry options like like little like pellets of laundry detergent as well mm -hmm. yeah there's powder options um, that are in recyclable cardboard boxes um, and then there there's a new type um, that i haven't used yet where it's like a sheet almost like um 
or like laundry pods where it's in a, a container that dissolves in there or like litter, little paper sheets that you throw in. And so there are a lot of options out there, but it may take some trial and error to find what works for you and what is healthy for your skin and all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just saw a question in the chat about if soap nuts work well. I had the same question this week because I'd never heard of them before. And I was like, what? And it's just like acorn looking things that you put in your laundry. That's crazy. But according to Audrey, um, they work and it seems like they do. Uh, but again, it might just depend on your personal situation. And I mean, you all can't smell me when I come into the office. So I'd, yeah. I'd say it's a success. Yes, I agree. We are six feet away though, so it's hard to know. Oh, true. Yeah. <laughs> Before it was fine too. <laughs> um, someone made a really good point that front loading washers, which are um, uh, water, use less water, um, can't use powder detergent. So that's a really great point. So it's possible those little pods that come in boxes might be a better option for that. Great point. And I did yeah. want to point out, I, I love wool dryer balls. Um, so instead of using those plastic dryer sheets to keep your clothes soft, um, I really love um, my uh, wool dryer balls and I just leave them in the dryer all the time. So if anyone wants to try those out or put it on your Christmas list, um, they're very cool. Yeah, they seem like great stocking stuffers. Uh, I also wanted to mention just in terms of the front loading washers, that's a really good point that your situation does determine what you can or can't do. So making changes that are easy for you and then moving on to more difficult ones is the best option. Definitely don't get stuck on, I can't use less plastic because I have a certain type of washing machine. We all have our own version of that. So definitely don't feel guilty about it um, and just do what you can. And that's totally yeah. okay. Yeah. And then also like looping back to what we said a couple times too, it's like, it's so fun when we're able to find like ways that work for us that don't have plastic and it feels like a little victory. It makes you feel really good about yourself and what you're doing. Um, and it's definitely important um, to vote with our dollars and, um, you know, reduce as much as we can. But you can't forget to go and, you know, do that research on initiatives, support groups that are um, proposing legislation that you support and will lead towards those huge, daunting, systematic changes that we really need to see. All right, next question is very close to my heart. Um, is there a way to buy chips without plastic? <laughs> I, I can't think of any. I don't think I've seen chips in a non-plastic bag except for tortilla chips sometimes come in a, oh, that's a paper bag that's lined with plastic. So. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, Stephanie just said make your own. That sounds like a really fun adventure. I'm not a chip person, I am a candy person, so. I don't have a good answer to this. Um, that does bring up a good point though, that there are definitely areas that are much harder to avoid plastic than others. So again, do what you can. If you can't live without chips, that is understandable, especially to Liz. But if you can make your own, that would be really cool. We'd love to hear about it if one of you guys can do that. And then, okay, is there another question? Uh, how, how often do, compostable items end up in the recycling on campus. I'm trying to picture our, our infographics. I can't you know it. Okay. We did a very large comprehensive study about this a couple years back, so this is such a cool question. Uh, do you have the image, Audrey? No, I think Liz has the answer. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so our waste study found that uh, about a quarter of our recycling is contaminated with non-recyclable material, which is uh, very significant, and 14% of all of our recycling is contaminated with food or compostable paper. Um, and that's by weight, and compostable paper is very light, so there is a lot of um, compostable coffee cups or compostable to-go boxes, paper towels that end up in the recycling along with lots of food. Um, so that's our primary concern for cleaning up our recycling and getting material out of the trash is to making sure people know how to compost and where to compost and what to compost. So that's our, that's our big goal um, to clean up our recycling because food, as Madeline mentioned already, is uh, a big impact on whether our recycling can be successfully recycled. Yeah, and again, check out our disposal guide if you're not sure if something is compostable or not, or email us, especially with a picture. Um, like we said, compostable plastic looks virtually identical to regular plastic. 
and the number seven on it does not mean it's compostable necessarily. So it is a great thing to look into. And again, I just want to plug when in doubt, you should throw it in the landfill. It is absolutely not helpful to put compostable items in the recycling or recyclable items in the compost. So that is a great question and definitely something that UW and probably lots of places struggle with. Next question, I think we already touched on, but I will um, touch on it really quickly, um, is that more folks have noticed plastic bags um, with grocery stores or restaurants using non-compostable or non-recyclable items uh, during the pandemic. And as Madeline mentioned, um, the Seattle ban ordinance on packaging has been temporarily lifted, um, not only because these restaurants are struggling, but because restaurants are using so much takeout, um, there, there's just not enough uh, to source all of the takeout containers. So, so one of our team members um, is doing the Plastic Free July Challenge and journaling, and it was like his first weekend and he went to his favorite food truck that always has, always has paper packaging and he got it in a styrofoam box and was heartbroken about it. So it is really hard right now, um, but we do hope that um, more sources become available for compostable and recyclable packaging for those restaurants and, and we can prevent that material. Um, um, I just wanted to mention that Brooke said in the chat that she can't see the previous chats and that we should send out the save the links. We definitely will send out all of them with our follow-up email. So no worries. You definitely don't have to be clicking on the links and saving a bunch of tabs right now. We will make sure you get them. Um, next question is that this presentation is very UW Seattle centric. Um, and what are the other campuses doing with respect to the program? I'll answer that one as well. Um, we can't, we are only trained to talk about um, the UW Seattle and, uh, campus and what our waste streams are. We're pretty familiar with the Seattle rules in general, um, but we're not uh, associated with Tacoma or Bothell's recycling programs. They have great programs, but we can't um, answer questions on how their, how their program relates to ours directly. Um, but if you are on those campuses, definitely reach out to the sustainability managers or recycling managers and uh, find out their websites are pretty in-depth as well. Um, someone asked about recommendations for bottles that have oily liquid in it. I, I like the peanut butter example, or maybe your olive oil container. How do you get those clean for recycling? Yeah. Um. Same thing that we've kind of said earlier, it's like if you can't get all of the oily residue out, that's totally okay. Um, but if you just put like a tiny drop of soap in there and, and swirl it around, usually that will help get most of the oil out. Um, but yeah, if you can't get everything out, it's not the not a huge deal. Just, you know, try to get as much as you can. Well, all right, well, that's 12 o'clock. Um, yeah. Um, then I will close the meeting. Again, thank you so much for paying attention to this and giving us your time. Again, we know it is a difficult world out there and this is not helping the problem, but we hopefully can make a solution to this. So again, thank you for joining our discussion today. Uh, check out our Facebook and Instagram. We have lots of future events and resources and please email us any other questions you have. We love answering our questions. It is literally part of our job. So it is not a bother. Um, we love taking your phone calls and questions. Um, yeah, and if you asked something today and we weren't able to get to it, we'll be able to save the chat and um, can share answers later. Yeah, we will send out uh, everything in a couple days once we get this up on YouTube. So feel free to watch it again or send it to other people. Um, but again, thank you so much. Uh, we hope you have a great Thursday. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.